Um, so I will keep my eye on that waiting room, um, but we're going to get started. So uh, I'll just ask all the readers, you can go ahead and mute yourself so that um, we're not getting any background noise and I will unmute you. Um, we are primarily reading in alphabetical order, but um, Joy is sneaking in a little bit first um, out of alphabetical order, but the rest is alphabetical order. Um, live transcription. Um, someone is requesting live transcription. So there is a Google Doc that I have um, posted in the chat. And um, I'm not sure live transcription means someone else is doing it. And I don't think we have that capability. Um, I'm just admitting a few more folks and I will again, put into the chat the Google document, which will let you follow along. All right, so we'll get started. Thank you all again so much for being here tonight for a very, very special Words Together, Worlds Apart, a reading series born out of this pandemic that just keeps going. Um, and it's meant to get us through this time, but also endure beyond it if we can try to see a time beyond it, which seems to be, at least for me, getting harder um, and harder. Uh, it's a reading series to maintain and build our community across distance and time zone through our shared love of words. Most of you are regulars by now, but for those who are here for the first time, please know that non-readers are gonna be muted through the duration of the reading. Um, but if you have a question or you want to, mm, or you want to quote somebody, please utilize that chat feature. It's a wonderful way to engage even as you're muted. After the reading, we're going to engage in dialogue and discussion. And at that point, you can raise your hand using the hand raise feature and I can unmute you. Please follow the reading series on all of the social medias and Please, if you can, donate. There's a suggested $5 donation to support the reading series and future readings. I've put that in the chat for you. It's also in the Google Doc. Today, we are coming together to honor the 80th anniversary of Babi Yar, the massacre in Kiev, Ukraine, where during the span of two days from September 29th to the 30th, over 33,000 Jews were murdered. While this is among the largest known exterminations by shooting squad, also known as the Shoah by bullets, it is one of so many that happened across the region. Um, the United States Holocaust Museum estimates that 1.2 million Jews were killed either by bullets or gas wagons at hundreds of locations across the German occupied Soviet Union. Though some historians estimate the numbers to be upwards of 2 million. These numbers are so vast uh, that they become abstractions that distance us from the atrocity rather than moving us closer to its memory. Most of these deaths have no material evidence, no memorial on this earth to return to, no gravestone, no names to be found in the archive. And among the unnamed somewhere lies my own great-grandfather. He organized for his family to be evacuated from Kyiv to the Ural Mountains in Siberia while he stayed back as a partisan in the Oblast. While Kyiv was still under bombardment, my great-grandmother snuck back to find her husband in 1944, um, and he was nowhere to be found. For weeks, she heard nothing until a neighbor told her that someone had given him up to an SS officer. And others say they saw him dragged away. Others say they saw him walked to Babi Yar. My family assumes he was murdered there. But the truth remains missing without a trace. Like the post-mortem title given to him. This trauma continues to haunt my writing, the way I move about the world, and most of all, the way I raise my children. Tonight, I wanted to be among my writer kin. Um, I want to not cry, but I'm pretty sure I will cry at some point. Uh, I wanted to remember and commemorate this underrecorded and underrepresented part of the Holocaust narrative. 
and to ask the looming question, how do we bear witness to the unwitnessable? How do we remember what cannot be recalled? While literature can't fill these gaps in, in history, cannot serve as a record of historical truth, I think it can make these absences felt. It can bear witness to an emotional truth through the lyric. So I wanna thank all the readers and listeners gathered again. I will begin with a poem I wrote a year ago, one continuing to grapple with my ancestral absences and um, a poem that's about discovering that for the first time, my father's side, which I had never really um, known about, holds more unaccounted for dead, whose names and stories I, I, I've never heard. So here's my attempt at making these absences felt. The past doesn't rise like smoke. I don't envy even a second of your life, my mother says. Not a single second. Babushka agrees, pities me, the two, unmanageable kids, disabled husband. It's just so hard for you, she says, recalling how her face burned when she was left on the top bunk of the train evacuating her family from Kiev. The city not yet surrounded, but certain to fall. War more than memory. War the way she names her life, missing without a trace. Her father stayed back, died, and after him, she named her daughter Light. He has to lie at Babi Yar. Where else, she asks, watching the third night's candle smoke. I do not say black earth is made of all our dead. I do not say I'm tired of counting them. I say I will keep trying to find his name. I say our people are made of miracle and half believe it. When I ask my father about his dead, he doesn't know their names, just that they never left Odessa. The Shoichet neighbor survived. He recalls severed chicken heads, the godly way, and lit Hanukkah candles in their courtyard. He remembers smoke rising against December, gray on black until there was no trace of flame. But the past doesn't rise like smoke. There is nowhere for it to go missing. The past is every fried potato and charred wick. My son's nail singed, singing over the candles, the wrong words of a Hebrew blessing we were never taught. The past rises like swifts, perhaps, who stay aerial for months, digging for earth in the clouds, abandoning the sky only to make more birds who will rise and rise in swarms from narrow chimneys, who will refuse to smoke, who will return only once having left their names carved in unsuspecting air. And now to our incredible lineup. I'm going to forego bios and just read out the names of the next readers, um, just so we can hear the work. First up, we have Julia Alexieva. Thank you so much, uh, Julia. And I'm going to share my screen uh, as my uh, work comes from my uh, graphic novel, Soviet Daughter, that was published in 2017, um, which is a, a graphic memoir, a nonfiction graphic memoir um, about my great-grandmother's life in the former Soviet Union. So this comes from the later section of the book, one that I don't usually read from. So there are usually a lot of spoilers, so I try to redact them as much as possible. Um, and it's not strict, it's not strictly poetry, so it'll sound a little bit different, but um, so I prefer, it probably will look better if you, um, look at the Zoom versus looking at the document. Chapter nine in 1941 to 1942. The war began on June 22nd, a Sunday. That same day, all industrial plants were bombed. I got dressed, put on a gas mask and went to work, completely unaware that a war had begun. 
And I should say, this is, sorry, this is from my great grandmother's perspective um, and her name was Lola. Um, I got to work and said, oh, boss, I'm fed up with these drills. I can't even sleep on my day off. But Lola, this isn't a drill, it's war, actual war. And it just started, look. Kirill was mobilized by the army and had been training since May. When the war began, he had to leave immediately. Leo, Tanya, and the nanny were sent to live with my brother, Solomon. The streets were dark and terrifying, especially at night. Searchlights scoured the city. Army blimps hung in the air like rain clouds. The population was told to evacuate as soon as possible. In July, they started bombing train stations. Kiev was in all-out panic mode. The NKVD declared the important documents needed to be shipped out of Kiev as soon as possible. Everything was loaded onto a train, all documents from all the archives in the Secret Service. I was told to follow the rest of the NKVD staff and leave the city immediately. We had no idea where they were sending us and we took very few things, thinking we would only be gone for two or three months. The train moved at night in complete darkness to avoid getting bombed. I have no clue how we escaped unharmed. It's nothing short of a miracle. Wherever we stopped was bombed less than a day later. There was shouting and screaming all around. Everything was burning. People were dying. Terror and horror appeared wherever we looked. For almost 10 days, we lived in a boxcar of a train and finally arrived at Aktubinsk, Kazakhstan. I found an apartment with a woman named Shura whose husband was also sent to the front. She lived with her 10-year-old son and mother-in-law. Tanya would take Leo to daycare every day, go to school herself, and then go to the grocery store to buy dinner afterwards. After both secretarial work in the hospital, I'd come back to Shura's exhausted. In the summer, after we put the kids to bed, we'd put a gramophone on the porch, sit with some salted pork, pickles, a bit of vodka. A war was going on and we were listening to music, drinking, and talking about our sorrows. Shura, how often do you think of Alexei? Oh, Lola, every minute. I can't stop thinking about Kirill. What if he's dead? What if they captured him? What would I do? Oh, Lola, there's not much we can do. Hope, work hard, and everything will be okay. Meanwhile, in the, in the Ukraine, Baba Yar, September 29th to 30th, 1941, outside of Kiev, the deadliest two-day massacre of the Holocaust. Thank you so much. Ooh, it's gonna be hard moving from one of these to the other. Um, next, we have Joy Lee. Thank you, Julia and, and Julia. That was great. Um, this is a short excerpt uh, from a long poem in the voice of um, uh, a poet, a uh, German Czech Jewish poet, uh, writing in 1950s Prague, and she's remembering hearing about a massacre while she was being hidden as a young adolescent in a farmhouse. It's called Earth. You who worship God as nature, forget God's fascination with foreskins, fratricide, miscegenation, wars of extermination that bore these trees for years. Somewhere among them lies the pit, the yeshiva bochers of Brecht, ages 16 to six, scratched like animals with human fingertips. While deer nibbled leaves and needles exhaled, they died on hands and knees, ringed by riflemen who told them life meant proving they could dig begging the body made of dirt to open itself to them. Where do they lie? The 14th one who wouldn't die until he told the farmer's wife didn't live to tell where they dug the pit, only who, how, whose corpse shielded his. The night before they dragged me from her attic, the farmer's wife told me about the stump the moonlit midnight shudder when, as a girl, her mother brought her to sprinkle milk for protection or blood, a life for a life, 
and about the boy she'd found there hours before with a long, long neck and black silk eyes and a nose hooked, she said, like a pruning knife. I know, I interrupted. I know that boy. He lay there bleeding on the stump and as he bled, he whispered, she whispered. It was stifling in the attic. Wings rustled above our heads. Bats, I thought, or angels with small clawed hands. The candle guttered. She'd started shaking again. Her shadow on the sloping wall flattened and swelled like a pregnant deer. She told me he told her they told the boys they were going on a hike. It was a beautiful day, he whispered, not a cloud. And the men with guns, fathers and uncles, a grocer, a fireman, carrying the smallest, calling encouragement. Dig fast, they shouted. You'll live. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joy. Next, we have Khadara Barnada. Um, hi, everyone. Julia, thank you so much for gathering us together. Um, I'm grateful for your company on a difficult day. Um, I, I will say that um, my story is somewhat similar to Julia's in that um, we've confirmed that 60 family members on my mother's side were murdered in the Holocaust. My father's side is innumerable, um, hasn't been counted, but um, I guess it, it or the, the counting seems impossible. We know that um, his mother lost 11 brothers and sisters, but that's just one layer among, um, among many losses on both sides of my family. Um, this poem actually grew out of um, something I heard when I was eight or nine years old at my friend Joanna Jacobs birthday party. And um, I, I grew up in um, New Jersey in a very Jewish community and um, many of my friends, aunts, uncles, grandparents were Holocaust survivors. And um, all you had to do was kind of like hang out by old people who were drinking and you would start to hear the stories. Um, and the funny thing is, not fu funny, not funny. I after I wrote and published this poem, I wrote to Joanna Jacobs and I said, this is your grandmother's story. And she's like, oh no, my family wasn't killed there. They were killed. <laughs> and I was like, you know, she's like, try Rachel Slater. It might, it, I think it's her family. And it's just like all, all of us were kind of bonded in this very strange way, um, a difficult way. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is I, this also riffs in part off of some of Kiki Smith's images, sculptures, where um, there's one where she has a, a, a girl rising out of a wolf. This is called Wolf, wolf Child. Um, oh, one other thing I'll mention really quickly in terms of context, um, Bobby R is actually very, very fertile. It grows a lot of berries, um, but of course it's, um, it's, it's blood fruit, Wolf Child. A girl rose out of a wolf, peeled the soft fur back, ripped across her hips. The animal consumed from the inside. What have I done to survive? Wrist bones still wrenched, electricity of breath wired through my teeth. Feral, febrile, fear streaked the bloodline severed here. I had been left for dead in a forest of emerald dreams, scaling the nightmare ravine. 30 meters wide, 150 meters long, 15 meters deep and deep and deep. The bodies layer upon sloppy layer like a botched jelly cake. I ate what I needed, my mouth flooded with ink, blueberries, blackberries, the sour crush of black currants, and slept in a robe of cold skin. You can't catch me, 
You can't catch me, the jaw of the earth opening. Thank you so much. Wow, that poem. Um, stay tuned for me to post links to all of Khadara's amazing, amazing books. Um, next up, we have Rosebud, who I will unmute. <laughs> Hi everyone, can you hear me? Okay, um, my internet's been going in and, all, in and out all day. Um, so my grandmother was, was born in, in either Russia, Ukraine, Poland, like her family was, was from there. That's all I grew up knowing. Um, she spoke Russian, she spoke Yiddish. And she ended up, they ended up fleeing Russia and they went into Germany, her family. So as you can imagine what happened, they ended up in the camp. Um, and she lost basically her entire family. And when my father married my mother, my mother is Mexican and she converted from Catholicism to Judaism. And my mother told me she was very nervous about meeting my father's mother because you know they're very observant people. Um, and my mother being Mexican and a convert, she was always very nervous, but they ended up becoming like <laughs> thick as thieves, those two. And what I realized later, much later in life, the, re the reason why I think my grandmother got along with my mother was because of trauma and how they dealt with it. And I found this out when I became very ill in 2012, how my mother taught me how to deal with my autoimmune disease is how my grandmother taught my father to deal with the fact he got polio months before they had the vaccine. So that sort of ties it in all together. And this poem is from my latest book. Um, and it's called Poet Wrestling with Every Night She Crucify Herself. Abba doesn't talk about his childhood much or the little girl. It's mama who tells me about her, that they played together on Shabbat after his father died. And Safta had to work two jobs and would take no help from anyone. Mama's never asked if that household kept the Sabbath or what they believed. Mama showing rare restraint until it was discovered she contracted polio. And Safta burned his clothes and she burned what little toys they shared in her own pantyhose, even those the little one hadn't torn and grabbed for balance. But still my father was exposed and suffered, his eyes, his spine, a whole host. She died, I'm told, mama's breath hot on my skin. She's rubbing around the sting in my neck that burns and fades to numbness along arm and shoulder. I'm a little numb these days on my left side. It's not metaphorical. It's not political or related. So I wish it were perhaps another life. She died and she holds me, my mother, closer pushing down where I can't really feel, you have to be strong. And it's when she pulls away, I feel the blood running from sharp, sharp nails. Thank you. Thank you, Rosebud. What, what haunting ending to all these poems. Um, next we have Marina Blitzstein. Um, thank you so much, Julia. Thank you so much to the readers. Thank you so much for like putting this space together and um, giving me the strength to uh, approach these topics. I grew up, I had the privilege of growing up among Holocaust survivors, lived with my grandmother until she, until I was uh, 20 actually. And um, still somehow I've like actively avoided writing about it all just like deliberately. And 
now in my mid thirties is the first time that I'm trying to like muster up the strength and I'm really inspired by you, Julia. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm gonna read like a poemish essay that gives my context and um, it's called the Yedinse, which is where, it's called Holocaust Street Yedinse, which is where my mother's from and I'm pretty sure she's on this Zoom. Um, so I'm just gonna read like an excerpt, uh, certain parts from this. Yedinse, from the root, one, the singular, the only, the start of the count, the origin point, the root from which half my roots grow, but I turn to it exclusively, singularly. We visit it dutifully like a pilgrimage for the first time in 26 years, September 2017. We visit its cemetery first and I keep my eyes open for spirits. Anything that binds me to this plot of land I wasn't born in but spiritually consider my home. Back then I wrote, at the cemetery where my grandfather is buried, my mother's father who died just months before I was born, I wander over to a larger plot commemorated by a plaque or something. My father explains, they rounded up all the Jews in the village and took them to this field. They shot them all and buried them there one of the two mass graves in all of Moldova during the Holocaust. My father says this is sacred Jewish soil we're standing on, I leave a stone. But I search for both of them now and come up short, or something has been excised from the field, or really something has been pluralized. Mass graves, massacres, there were so many, some marked and some abandoned. Only single people can point to a field and show where the bodies were buried. All over Moldova, the plaques, the statues, a plague of them. I find a government document from 2010 online, Jewish heritage sites and monuments in Moldova, and comb through the changing transliterated names to look for mine, the one I saw with my own eyes, therefore mine, and find nothing. Julie Masses wrote a stunning little piece for the Times of Israel in July 2017 that I'm grateful for. A now defunct synagogue in Yedinse is up for sale on Holocaust Street. The street was given its name by a couple of non-Jewish socialists to commemorate what happened there, another mass execution. Quote, the street dedicated to the memory of Holocaust victims, Yuri Zagorsia explained. However, to fit the name on street signs, the city required that it be shortened to one word. So it was shortened to Holocaust. Street. I venture down Holocaust Street, as it shall now henceforth be called, in my mind. The street where these memories happen are happening, not my memories, but they might as well be, post-memory for the avant witness. I wake up at night and I remember it, or I think about it. It's all still happening there. I do it while pregnant and wonder what visions I give to the future. Better not to give them or better to give them right. Know them well. Tell the stories so the next generation stays vigilant, observant, guardians of the truth. My grandmother was not one to sugarcoat the stories. She didn't shy away from them like other survivors we heard about. But as I got older, I noticed her sleights of hand. She would say some young women lost their periods for years. I was fully in my 30s when I realized she also meant herself. My mother says, one young mother lost her mind on the march to the ghetto after soldiers put her baby on a tree stump and shot it from afar. She held a blanket to her body the rest of the way. Should I be spared these details, especially in my, as they say, delicate condition? The horrors aren't fit for words, but they're worth leaving here, lest we get fooled by the Wikipedia page that calls it a deportation. It wasn't a deportation, it was a death march. I Google map the distance, a 44 hour walk. How many nights must that have been for masses of people? My sister disagrees, it wasn't a death march, not officially, but these are semantics because the Holocaust is a street with formal language and we don't feel we have access to it, let alone permission to forge it for ourselves. You're not editing history, my husband says, you're reflecting on it for yourself. Would that this labor were enough. Would that a writer was enough to name these horrors. It takes a journalist, a researcher, an academic, a historian. It takes degrees and time and therapy. I can't imagine it also takes reflection or poetry or thinking about it late into the night, banishing the thoughts, feeling guilty for banishing them, feeling like a fraud for not getting the story right, feeling like a fool for my American translation, my American habits of mind, my American frameworks and expressions. And who to do it for? To whom do we leave the ruins of the past, the plaque, the museum? Not to the dead, not for the children of survivors, but for their own children and our children after us, made strangers to time, who might come upon them in a field and keep returning there. 
I got to hear this poem twice today, <laughs> every time. Beautiful, thank you so much, Marina. Um, and next we have Zach Goldberg. Thank you, yeah. Um, thank you so much, Julia, for holding this space and uh, everybody else who's here reading and everybody else who's here listening and witnessing. Um, it's been a while since I, since I read poems, so I, I really appreciate it. And um, this is a really, really nice opportunity, even though it's, you know, hard, obviously. Um, my entire lineage on both sides of my family are from Eastern Europe, um, sort of the areas where the, the borders of Russia are now, where the borders sort of moved a lot. Um, and luckily, most or all of my immediate family was gone from the old country um, by the middle of the 20th century. My namesake did die in the Warsaw Uprising. So that's sort of, there is still a lot of history there. I do take a lot of pride and interest in that. A lot of my work right now is exploring that um, that history and my experience with my Jewish tradition um, and the idea that as, as Jews, we move to a place and we stay there as long as we can and then we move on. Um, been thinking and writing a lot about that. And so this poem, uh, I just have a short poem, and this sort of comes out of that intersecting with a weird situation in which um, over over the pandemic, my partner got very into house plants because that's what you do. Um, and they were telling me about uh, the Tradescantia, which, you know, the common name is the wandering Jew. Um, and of course, the etymology of that is anti-Semitic. Um, and then we ended up talking with my aunt about this. My aunt was like, oh, I love my wandering Jew. And I love it. Like I, I, and we're just like, no, you can't say that anymore. But like, she's like, I don't care. I love it. Um, so this poem is called Tradescantia. From the mundane root, an oyster plant, a spider wort. It's variegated purple across nearly every flowering inch of the world. Sweet Moses in the cradle lily, amethyst angel of doubt, O oh, Lucy, saint of sight, blind me to etymology, the purse plum pit in every story about God. What wild flower deserves this wandering to be buried in a grave so violet, a name so violent it once curbed the crucifixion? Yes, cursed to Rome until Christ returns. Sisyphean in our ignorance, my aunt gave cuttings away each winter as a Hanukkah gift. We all need a little Jew in our lives. Terracotta exodus. Tangles of it endlessly growing, creeping across oceans, spreading over continents, the lurking of a lesser theology, O oh Lord, leave us to our legs, our purple leaves. Lord, where we grow, so do the conditions for surrender. Look us in the root, O oh Lord, Lord, let even the seed of a curse bloom into a blessing. Thank you. Thank you for that. Beautiful. Um, next we have Jared Carroll. Thanks. Hey there. Uh, thank you, Julia, for bringing us together. This is this is uh, attending something like this and hearing all this beautiful work is a, it's about as religious as it gets for me. So thank you. Um, so uh, the, my grandparents on my mom's side. They were both born in Poland uh, near the Ukraine border, uh, both Holocaust survivors. And growing up, um, my grandfather would talk kind of compulsively about his experiences uh, in the camps and kind of during the war. Um, he would, every, every Shabbat, he would come to all our classes and, and talk. Um, and my grandmother would never say a word. Uh, so she never said a word. She died not saying a word. And so, um, I kind of grew up with both language and silence uh, about, about their experiences. And um, the poem I'm gonna read, uh, it has a little bit of language and silence. The first half of the poem is kind of redacted or crossed out. Uh, can, you can see it in the Google doc. It's also, you can kind of see it here. So you can see the words, but it's also crossed out. Um, the poem is called On Suffering. And also I'll start from the part that's not crossed out. On suffering. To be clear, I'm no expert. I know only that suffering simmers in every heart, singes in plain sight like an electric stove. 
And though my grandfather told me over and over, I don't know how he made it through bone and mud in some shithole Polish village in 1941, or how he lost everything brutally and kept shuffling into light. Thank you. Thank you. Keep just getting goosebumps. I'm sure so many people in the room are as well. Um, next, we have Nina Kosman. Hi, I will read in my poem in Russian and in English. I write in both languages. Um, the original was in Russian, even though sometimes I write at first in English, but this one, the original was in Russian, so I'll read the Russian one first. Um, I don't want to talk too much about my, my ancestors and so forth, but I'll just mention that over 40 members of my extended family were killed, not in Babi Yar, they didn't live in Kyiv, but in other cities in Ukraine, like Lutsk, Rovna, Krivoy Rok, and in Latvia, in Riga, where my, um, uh, my father's ancestors lived since the 17th century, uh, they were all killed. Uh, my father escaped uh, during the war. Um, anyway, so here is the poem in Russian first. Где сестра твоя не путевая, говорила мать. Сегодня мы всей семьей идем умирать. В дверь слышь, фрицы опять стучат. Собирайся быстрей, зачем тебе столько книг? Там, где мы будем, обойдешься без них. Всегда ты последний, сынок, говорила мать. Ну вот, собрались, а теперь ему хочется спать. Выспишься там, где будем вместе лежать. Чем книги в мешок совать, сестру бы отыскал. Ну что за дурак в самом деле, какой вокзал? Вот и сестра нашлась, лежат всей семьей. А тот, что колонну их вел на убой, до пенсии дожил, до внуков и даже до пра. У внуков натуры тонкие, не надо их тра вмировать болтовнёй про какой-то лес. Что с того, да мало ли на свете мест? Что с того, что поляна, ведь никто не воскрес? А про то, как дед его метился в мать, да про то, как младшему хотелось спать, а когда упал на мать, из рук выпал мешок, посыпались на тела книги, да какой-то мелок. Молчите, зачем вы внуку-то про ваш лесок? И now I'll read the same thing in English. In English it doesn't rhyme. Where's your good for nothing sister, said his mother. Today we're going to die together as a family. Don't you hear? The crowds are knocking at the door again. Collect yourself quickly and why take so many books? Where you're going, you'll manage without them. You're always the last one, son, said his mother. Time to get ready and now you want to sleep? You'll have a good sleep where we're going to lie down together. Rather than slip books in your bag, find your sister. Well, what a fool you are indeed, what station? There's your sister, found at last. The whole family lies here together. And the one who led their column to slaughter lived to collect his pension to have grandchildren and even great-grandchildren, all of whom are so sensitive, they'd be hurt by talk about some sort of forest. So what? Aren't there all kinds of forests in the world? So what? No one is going to rise from there. So don't talk about how he aimed for the mother and about how her youngest boy wanted to sleep and how his body fell on the mother's and how the books and some chalk dropped from his hand onto the bodies. Thank you so much, Nina. Thank you for the gift of both languages in our ears to uh, a nice transatlantic moment for us all. And now we have Lynn Melnick. Hey, um, I'm feeling a little emotional from listening to all this. So my voice is a little shaky. Um, thank you for having me. And um, I'm reading a poem uh, called The Night of the Murdered Poets. And I, it, I have a book coming out called Refuse Nick. And it's a lot about the ideas of Jewishness and Americanness and American Jewishness. And um, this is, um, this poem is called The Night of the Murder Poet. It refers to a night uh, a little bit after 
uh, why we're here, but uh, August 12, 1952, uh, during which 13 Soviet Jewish intellectuals were executed in a prison basement in Moscow on charges of like treason and espionage and all this bullshit. Um, and then um, they, uh, you'll, you'll get to it in the poem, but I wanted to point out in case anyone here listening doesn't know, I refer to the prayer of the Shema, which is regarded by many Jews to be the most important prayer that we have, which it serves as a reminder that, that we have, that there's only one God. Um, and I think everything else is self-explanatory. The Night of the Murdered Poets. I am writing this on a plane to California with several pens in my bag and all the water I want. It was evening when I left and will be evening when I get there. Sometimes I look at photos of myself and wonder why I was not smiling. It's hard to imagine we once mattered so much that they'd round us up. I mean, poets. I know Jews have often been rounded up. I am contemplating a vermin metaphor here just because of how hard it is to get us, but I know better. I had to look up cosmopolitanism in my dictionary. Forgive me, I did have a school, but I didn't show up much. I was too busy trying to murder myself. Stalin thought cosmopolitanism contemptible and Jewish. Want to demolish the core of a community? Once upon a time, you could simply kill the poets. But more poets arose in their place. Well, more poets arose in this place, I should say. I was growing. What is the word for something that grows peculiar and withstanding in California like the orange tree not native to this soil? The first poem I wrote was about bleeding from my uterus onto glare drenched stairs. After the poets died in a prison basement, the Soviets smashed the Yiddish linotype machines. I had to look up linotype. When I left pencils behind, I bought myself a typewriter. I'm writing this on a laptop in the sky. After the poets died, the location of their remains was kept secret from their families. Their families were exiled to Siberia. Their families were social outcasts. I only just learned about this. I was a social outcast as a girl. I'd get so high I'd forget to brush my teeth. I want to remember how ill-starred the prison basement as I imagine it. I am finishing this on a plane from California. It was afternoon when I left and will be night when I get home. I believe in little, but I always say the schma on airplanes. I want to remember that we'll never know the murder weapon, but we do know it, of course, several metaphors deep. I want to remember that until recently, I didn't know any of this. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you for bringing us to, you know, uh, the important notion that these atrocities against the Jews really in the Soviet territory continued for many, many years. Mm -hmm. That Stalin killed as many, if not more uh, Jews than Hitler did. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. Next, we have Luisa Muradian. Hey everyone, um, thanks for thanks for being here. This is such an honor to share this space with everyone. Um, and I uh, trying to think. I'll, I'll try to keep it a somewhat condensed version. My paternal grandmother, um, she's from Odessa, and she sort of survived um, the Holocaust by hiding in a basement and then actually almost getting caught, and then she had to be moved to the catacombs where she hid under the city for the rest of the Holocaust as a teenager. And that really impacted the rest of her life and, and sort of like just for years and years, she like changed her name and dyed her hair and, and tried so hard to um, just rid herself of every possible aspect of that experience. Um, and really only we learn more about it as she got older and got sick. Um, and then we learn a lot more from her uh, sister. But my maternal grandmother is sort of what this poem is actually focused on. And especially, you know, thinking about Bobby Yar, um, she was not involved in Bobby Yar, but um, that type of event occurred throughout Ukraine on, you know, on smaller scales many, many times. Uh, my, that side of my family is from a, a small Jewish village outside of Kordistan. And, um, you know, my, so her mother and her mother's sister 
a one night sort of heard and found out that people were coming to the village the next morning to round up and exterminate um, the Jewish people that were in there. And so they together made the decision to take their young children and run through the forest. And for, I think it took them almost three days to get through until they found a train that they were able to get on. These two women, um, both of their husbands had been dead by then. And they, they just were two women and their young children. And they hopped the train and got ended up in Uzbekistan where they were able to live out the rest of the Holocaust. But um, I just, I think, you know, as someone who has young children now, I just, I, it really strikes me. And last year, um, we I moved to Kansas City, but before that we lived in this house kind of out towards a forest in Manhattan, Kansas. And my grandmother came to visit and, you know, our entire backyard was just forest and, and it really struck her. Um, it just really reminded her. And it was like, again, a rare moment when she would sort of talk about her experience, but she just really remembered going through and, and she was almost, she was four, almost five, and which is the same age as my son um, now, which is sort of part of the driving engine of, of this poem and sort of thinking a lot about her experience. So, and also one thing I'll say is this is a poem, if you're like, who's Julia? Like, who's the Julia I'm writing to? It is this Julia, Julia, I love you. Okay. Um, dear Julia, I can't help but think that my son is the same age as my grandmother and I am the same age as my great grandmother when I hold his body tightly and run toward the field of trees behind our yard. And here there are only wild turkeys whirling their strange music in the sunlight and not a symphony of bullets ripping open bodies of woodland creatures. It's what she remembered, Julia. One moment, a red tail brighter than the burning bush so bright she was struck by its beauty and then the world erupting in the darkness. By the time they reached the train, everyone on board was dying. The conductor shoveled bodies off the cars as if he were unloading firewood. Another memory, but not as searing as the tail. She thinks it was a squirrel, maybe something from one of her picture books. Perhaps she imagined it, not yet a writer, but already knowing the importance of beauty as a means of survival. By the time they arrived at the mountains, my great grandmother had already lost her husband, her mother, her aunts, her brothers. I let my son walk toward the turkeys and they let him too. No one is afraid here and the air is golden. Every time with that poem, Louisa, every time. Um, our next reader is Jason, ugh, Jason Schneiderman. Schneiderman. <laughs> okay, I'm just, it was just a full mouthful, Jason. Full uh, mouthful. Thanks, no, no, it, it always says, um, thank you. I'm, I'm also, um, I've been thinking a lot about Stalin and and actually what's underneath this poem is Trotsky, um, who was a military genius in the Russian Civil War, but made two terrible errors, one which was not stopping Stalin and the other which was undermining the Bund, uh, which was the largest um, socialist Jewish organization. It was the largest socialist organization. It was it was it was Jewish, and at the Second International, he convinced them to kind of throw their lot in with the Bolsheviks and to surrender um, a kind of J Jewish identified organization, which weakened them. And we know how that turned out. Um, so this poem, um, the Parable of the Dictator, uh, is forthcoming in Virginia Quarterly Review. Um, the Parable of the Dictator, and also. Um, we seem to have lived through a golden age of Jews in the United States. And if you know your Jewish history, you know how those end. Um, and I'm afraid. The Parable of the Dictator. After the death of the dictator, his son wanted him embalmed. His son wanted him on perpetual display in a glass box. No one knew what the dictator had wanted. The dictator had made it a crime to even speak of his death. He had not left instructions for his corpse. 
The dictator's son summoned our country's most skilled embalmers and put them to work on embalming his father. He announced the project with great fanfare. Shortly after, the dictator's daughter interrupted the embalmers, putting a stop to the project. She wanted the dictator's body to be hollowed out for her to wear as a suit on special occasions. The embalmers told her that a full body suit would not be possible. They explained that they were not taxidermists, but rather embalmers. She had the embalmers shot and brought in taxidermists and a number of bear corpses to use for practice. When the dictator's son learned of his sister's interference, he had the taxidermist shot and brought in new embalmers. The daughter, in turn, had the new embalmers shot and brought in new taxidermists. The dictator's son laid a trap for his sister, but she fled the capital for the safety of one of her strongholds. Packing lightly, she took only the dictator's preserved head, which had been fashioned into a mask for her to wear. In the long civil war that followed, the daughter of the dictator regularly addressed her followers in long speeches while wearing her father's head. The faction led by the son were particularly furious about the body of the dictator not being on display in a glass box. As we watched the dictator's daughter's speech on the giant screen in our re-educational detention center, you reminded me that in the time before the dictator had become the dictator, I had admired his daughter's perfect teeth. Oddly, I was warmed by the memory. We still had a house then. Before the dictator, it had been normal to think about having nice teeth or nice hair. In those days, we thought a lot about our happiness and what to wear. I made a joke about mindfulness and you laughed silently so the guards wouldn't notice us talking or holding hands. Now, as I look up at the screen, I think, well, this is happening. And it is. Wonderful, thank you, Jason. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Sasha Sindirovich. Uh, thank you. And thank you to Julia for organizing this and also for uh, letting me into the space, which is not something that I've done before. Uh, I don't write poetry or original prose, but I moonlight as a translator. So uh, I'm here to read something that I have translated together with uh, my colleague Harriet Morav at the University of Illinois. Uh, and this is by one of the victims of uh, August 12, 1952, uh, that Lynn Melnick had read her poem about. Uh, the Yiddish writer David Bergelson, um, and uh, the story was, uh, it's called A Witness, or An Aedus in Yiddish, uh, and it was published in 1946 in the Soviet Union, uh, and in the Russian translation, also in the Soviet Union in 1947, um, and this is our translation that we just did this year uh, into English, uh, and this will be uh, included in a book that we're working on together, uh, which will collect stories by six different writers from the Soviet Union, uh, that we'll call In the Shadow of the Holocaust, uh, short fiction by Jewish writers from the Soviet Union, from Yiddish and from Russian. Uh, so this is just a very short excerpt from a story. I'll just give you a little bit uh, of the context. Uh, the setting is it's 1945, it's right after the war. We're in an unnamed Soviet city, which is identified as a capital of a city, as, as a capital city of a Soviet Republic. So it's likely Kiev, which Bergelson had known. Uh, from uh, when he lived there right after the revolution. Um, and they're, they're, the two protagonists here, there's an unnamed man who is identifying the story as a Jew or the Jew as the Yid, uh, who doesn't have a name uh, and who presents himself as a survivor of a death camp near Lvov, uh, which could be Majdanek. Um, and uh, also the other protagonist is a younger woman, probably in her thirties, her name is Dora. Uh, and her par parents had perished in the city, so likely Kiev, maybe by BR, right? So we, we don't know. Uh, and the man dictates to Dora his testimony. Uh, he dictates it in Yiddish, and she transcribes it 
as she translates it in Russian. Uh, so the story invites us to think about the immediacy of testimony and also translation. Uh, so this brief excerpt. Uh, Dora wrote it down faithfully and without hurrying, took, taking pains to make sure that in translating the old Jews Yiddish, no mistakes and no distortions would slip in from the Russian. Her shoulders were hunched over for hours in her patient dedication to this task, just as they were for whole days on her job, at her job at the city hall. Her diligence was deeply rooted, constant. She had inherited it from her father, the scientist, and her grandfathers, who were learned Jews. The Yiddish here is Lamdonim, for those of you who know Yiddish. Uh, as she found out from people in the city, the Germans had done practically the same thing to her father that they had done to the Jews at the camp near Lvov. In the early morning before they hang him, they put him in a harness, the same kind used for horses, with a collar and a yoke, and forced him to drag a barrel of water along the main street. As she read some of the words of her Russian translation aloud to the Jew, Dora's face and voice were full of earnest purpose. She wanted to know whether she had understood him correctly. Yes, said the Jew, swaying uneasily and giving the matter some thought. I guess so. One time he answered, you asking for my expertise? What can I tell you? The suffering was in Yiddish. And the Yiddish here is, Ditsoros is given of Yiddish, which is such an interesting line. The old man's blackened face was reminiscent of a burned stick of wood, rescued from fire and flames. He seemed to smell of singed bones. Dora had placed a long bench close to the table so he could recline on it while he spoke. The remnants of, of life in him was, was so weak that he was barely able to speak. Nonetheless, the Jew told her about one of the first groups that was taken from the death camp to the gas chamber to be poisoned and burned. There were many, many other groups, so many, endless numbers of them. There was something unique in each one, a trace that wouldn't vanish. In one group, he said, there was a lovely young woman, a great beauty. I've never seen anyone as beautiful as her in my life. There was a young painter in the same group, also a Jew. The Germans demanded that he paint her in full color, as naked as the day she was born. He painted and cried and painted and cried, and she told herself that they would let her live because of her beauty. The young man, the painter, also believed the same thing as did others. Afterwards, they took her with everyone else into the gas chamber. Dora jotted everything down quickly, completely forgetting that she had to be careful to avoid mistakes, translating the old man's Yiddish into Russian. Suddenly, the Jew fell silent, apparently from weakness. Dora waited a while, not lifting her eyes from the lines she had just finished. A faint sound of sobbing reached her at that moment, accompanied by sniff, a sniffling and groans. The weeping nagged at her persisting like the buzzing of a fly that kept banging into the window and pushing into the glass of the window pane. Dora was surprised the old man had enough strength to tell her about all kinds of atrocities, but now he was crying. Tears, one after the other, were running down the many furrows of his long face and hung on, the, on one hair that stuck out from his scanty beard, a hair as coarse as straw cut with a scythe. What's the matter? Dora asked the Jew. You're crying? Yes, the Jew barely managed to say as he wept because of her beauty, which they burned. It really breaks my heart. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sasha, for bringing that very necessary translation. And I can't wait for the book. Um, I can't believe we're at our final reader, last but certainly not least, Yara Sugarman. Um, please stay for conversation after. Thank you so much, Julia, for curating this reading. Um, I'm so honored to be among all of you. Um, my own relationship to the Shoah by Bullets is that most of my family members were murdered during the Holocaust, either in Nazi-occupied Poland or in the Soviet Union. Um, my late parents survived both Hitler and Stalin's genocidal regimes. Um, having traveled to the city of Lvov, um, they were subjective to, subjected to Nazi and Soviet brutality. I'm just going to read a brief passage that talks a bit about this. It's from my memoir in progress. It's called The Unfurling Wings. I don't remember when I took the picture, but I must have surveyed the room for brightness. And I don't remember which camera I used, possibly the knicker mat that I'd inherited from my older brother, Alan, 
along with the moss green firebird I drove when he outgrew them. Maybe I pressed the camera's pebbly metal to my face, my hand steadying its heavy body. I imagine this because in 1978, I was a young woman intent on preserving the world through the solemnity of black and white film. I was also a hunter of light. Like a hound able to track prey by means of scent, my cameras stalked luster, the gentle sheen of any person, thing, or scene. The image my camera helped me capture that day was of my mother, a Polish Jew, a refugee, and a Holocaust survivor who also survived the Soviet gulag system of forced labor camps. She and my fa father finally settled in Toronto in 1951, six years after World War II ended. In my photograph, her back is turned toward me, her silhouette rimmed with gleam. She is briefly caught up in her freedom. Hunched over her sewing machine, she was probably dreaming for a few minutes the way the air dreams. Most likely she was singing a Yiddish song that begins with a question, especially resonant given her displacement and banishment from her land of birth. Where can I go when every door is locked? Like my cameras, my mother's sewing machine provided her with companionship, particularly after I left home to study, first in Montreal, then in New York City. Her machine was like a pet, a purring cat that arched its back in the glow of a window. The dress my mother wore as she nudged silk under the needle's gentle drill was partly unzipped so that a flap of striped fabric hung below her neck, a loose little triangle, the unfurling of a wing, something she passed on to me despite her wish that I stay settled down, something to boost her from her loneliness into the day's brilliant wildness. And for my mother, as well as for my father, every day was wild and fierce. I was visiting my parents' home in the suburbs. Their house was a salve that soothed their, soothed their in, inescapable grief as they discerned the numinous figures of our family members. These were relatives who'd been murdered by the Nazis in German-occupied Poland or in Stalin's Siberian gulags, where my mother managed to save one sister and my grandmother by sewing for the wife of the labor camp's commander and by cutting down trees. When I was a young woman, I didn't truly grasp my parents' hunger for the safety and stability they found in Canada, nor did I understand that the absences left in their lives were, to them, palpable with heat. These absences con constituted the fundamental geography of their souls, a geography of loss and daily despair. Not only had my parents survived the systematic genocide of six million Jews perpetrated by Hitler and the Nazis, but they also had survived Stalin's mass killings of more than a million of his own citizens in the Soviet Union, death by execution, forced labor, famine, massacres. My father and mother were each day alive with family members who had been murdered awake with their deaths from early morning until late at night, when my parents tuck the dead into bed beside them. Thank you. Thank you, Julia and everybody. Ah, oh, what a way to uh, close uh, the tucking in of the dead as so many of us do, I think. I mean, that's what a haunting and amazing image. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I would really like to open um, it up to questions. I'd like to once again urge you in the audience to please support these writers by buying their books so that we can have more of these stories. Um, and um, yeah, if you have a question, raise your hand um, while you're thinking of it. Um, I really wanted to ask, and this is something that I've asked some of you in written form, so some of you had had more time to think about it. But I'm really interested in how you conceive of yourself 
with respect to witness. Um, and I'm asking that specifically that way because when I ask, do you consider yourself a witness? That's a tougher question. Um, but how you conceive of your writing um, and maybe just the way you move about the world with respect to witness, bearing witness. Um, and I will allow all of you to unmute all of the readers and you can just jump in. And if um, the audience members have questions, please feel free to do the hand raise feature. Um, I'll just, I'll start um, maybe being the senior person in this group, I've had more time to think about it, but I, which doesn't necessarily mean I think about it with any more depth. Um, but I, I often refer back to Marianne Hirsch and her idea of post-memory and the way in which um, she's a scholar, she was at Columbia, I think she's still there, and just the way in which um, we're sort of vicarious, we be, or I felt myself to become a vicarious sort of witness. Post-memory is a kind of vicarious witness where the trauma has been so um, ingrained in the children and the and, and grandchildren and great-grandchildren that that the um, the legacy becomes that of the that the, the experience actually almost feels like that of the children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. It becomes so much a part of them. So that's what she means. The term post memory has been important to me. Adara, do you want to say anything more about epigenetics that you just put into? Oh, geez, yeah, maybe. I, I, <laughs> I yeah, I, um, I feel like th there was someone else who spoke about hiding, not writing about the Holocaust for a very long time, and it's only something that I've come to, uh, probably in the last ten years or so, um, and. Um, so part of me feels like a witness and I feel like I need to res I need to respect that it wasn't me myself in these scenarios that I read about or research about or hear stories about. But um, the other part of me is, um, I don't know, thinks about poetry as channeling and kind of opening up to the spirits and the ancestors and um, allowing, uh, giving permission to what has been so overwhelming and so haunting um, and so much in the fabric of my cells. Um, so um, not being witness, being, being there, um, allowing my imagination to take me there. So I think there's a, for me, there's a balance Witness feels too easy in a way. It feels too removed, but at the same time, there's a gesture of respect there. Like I, I was not in the Holocaust. I was not, I cannot say that I was, but at the same time, I don't wanna be, uh, holding myself from a distance isn't the work that my poems call me to do. My poems throw me into the fire. That's it. It's, it's, it has happened, it is happening. Um, so, so for me, it's a strange dance around this idea of witness. Yeah, I would, I would love to echo that. And, and for, I think permission is the new thing that I'm experimenting with because I did not feel that and I have not given that to myself. And that's, um, that's like further silencing. Do you know what I mean? Because balanced against that is this obligation, which is having been close to witnesses having been close to the testimony such as it was right like memory being like wishy-washy and faulty and I think that's where poetry comes in and art but I am now grappling with this huge weight I think I always have been of like having to tell the story because so many are gone my grandmother is now gone you know my grandparents that generation is unable to tell the story for themselves and I think it's our responsibility to make it resonate in, in this time. And that's like, 
a hell of an important task right now, you know, because that's like when we need to remember and when we need to remind people that this has happened before and it definitely can happen again. I also wonder just hearing both you, Hadara and Marina speak, if it has anything to do for you at least with motherhood. Like, I feel like I thought that mm. the next generation, oh, I could finally stop writing about the past, but motherhood actually did the opposite. And I'm like, oh my God, I am more obsessed with the past than ever before. It's like seeing that next generation rekindles that fire to understand where we all come from so that you can teach them or so that you can shelter them from this terrible inheritance that we ourselves haven't been able to get away from. Yeah, just going off that actually, that was something I was thinking about as well, was that idea that um, like I never had to learn about the Holocaust. I felt like it was something I knew my entire life. And, it, and I didn't, I think going off that, I never felt such a strong urge to write about it. Like I didn't feel such a strong urge to like watch movies about it, read books about it. Cause it was always just all around. My grandfather always spoke about it. My, my parents always spoke about it. So it wasn't until I had children that I was like, oh, they, they actually have to learn about it. This is something mm -hmm. that, we're, you know, it's mm -hmm. gonna be on me and like my family like teach them because my grandparents are around and it wasn't just always there. And so I think through that, that understanding that they, they're not like born knowing it in that way, that I felt it seemed that I was, um, that I kind of started writing about it and it started kind of uh, entering some of my poems. A lot, of, a lot of what's being said here is making me think a lot about um, the Passover service and, and thinking about like you yourself were in Egypt, like that's sort of the reading of it that I'm familiar with. Is like you should be participating in this as if like you were part of it. Um, and I have definitely experienced that as well when it comes to the Holocaust in terms of like my grandmother, you know, consistently tell me about this. This is still happening. This is not history. This is a thing that is currently important and is happening. And I think in terms of the way that I experienced that, I felt a lot of adolescent resentment maybe at being forced to participate in a thing that I felt not that it had nothing to do with me but that it was it was in the past which yes you know affects what is happening now but is not actually happening now and I think to some degree I still feel that and I think I struggle and I think that's part of the work that I try to to write about um is that tension between being a witness and being a participant like are those the same things I had the complete opposite experience. I think that a lot of people had to where um, I had, I was, I knew that my grandmother had been in the war and they, they, that's the word that was used in English was just that she was in a war. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do with, at the time at least, there was a lot of shame in being a, a survivor and maybe it had been different in other uh, generations, but my grandmother was stuck in that generation where she was from. Um, and so there was just a lot of secrecy. And it's really interesting too, because I'm, I'm a little bit different than I think a lot of Jews in that I also grew up very observant. Um, I grew up in a very modern Orthodox household, but I was also very close to Mexican Catholicism. And what was interesting is that my mother's family was also very secretive about things of their own history, particularly of things that had gone on on the US-Mexican border with, particularly with young women. Um, and I just kind of grew up in this culture of silence, whether it was anti-Semitism where uh, on the border in South Texas, I was always told, don't wear your Star of David, don't wear your Star of David. I was like the only Jewish kid at my school and nobody understood what that was. Um, and then, you know, the other secrecy was what happened, happens to young girls on the border, including myself. And I was just surrounded by this culture of shame and silence. And it wasn't until I really got to college that I, you know, and I was in New York at that point that I could have these conversations at a distance with my father, but also long after my, my grandmother was gone. And he said, yeah, she was in the camp. She lost her whole family. And I, I didn't know that until I was like 18. So 
you know, I don't think there's one universal idea of witnessing. I think too that the word witness can seem at least to me sort of passive. And I think, you know, with the further generations, you're asking yourself, well, it's not, it, these, I didn't go through these things and yet who else do these, you know, do these stories belong to, right? Um, and I think of that often when I was, when I was trying to figure out why my grandmother was the way she was and I didn't have that knowledge till I was older. Yeah, if I could jump in, I had a very similar experience when it came to secrecy. Um, I also grew up in a, an area in Chicago, in, in Chicago where there were no other Jews. It was a very ethnically diverse area, but not, not in terms of people like me. So um, I was also told not to, I actually write about this a bit in that book, but um, wasn't supposed to wear anything that made me look particularly Jewish, wasn't mm -hmm. supposed to try to blend in. And in, in I was not surrounded by Holocaust imagery uh, growing up. Uh, in fact, uh, the war was always talked about as defeating Germans. They were Nazi killers, you know, it was that they were very proud. Um, and there was so much uh, devastation that happened during World War II, but that was not discussed. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of emphasis of like the pride of being the, you know, the, the killers of Nazis, <laughs> but which was awesome, you know, but, but um, I, it was only later where I found out like the real sort of truth about how many people in my family died and it was at least 85% of my family was, was murdered during that time. Um, but uh, it also, the idea of witnessing actually makes me wonder whether um, it's actually only really my generation in terms of my family at least that's really able to confront the, these issues. It was just so buried, you know, that people were not able to really confront everything that happened and with the difference in culture and generation, I wonder whether finally it can actually be grappled with now where it wasn't able to before. Amelia is raising her hand. Amelia Glazer has a hand. Happy to unmute you, Amelia. I got unmuted. Awesome. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't see the hand raise feature. It didn't. I, I, yeah, I just raised my hand because I feel like we're in the room together. And I. Yes, I'm so glad that that feeling is there. It's so nice to see you. It's been years. <laughs> it's nice to see you also. Thank you for putting this together. This was really beautiful. I'm, I'm still kind of reeling from what I've just heard. Um, and I, I, I have a question for whoever wants to answer, and it has to do with your audience, with your readers. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm wondering whether at, in writing these very personal stories, even though they're going back potentially a couple of generations, you're thinking about a Jewish audience, a Jewish readership, or whether you might also be thinking about a readership that is the other kind of witness, the kind of witness that if not descendants of perpetrators are descendants of beneficiaries of particular acts of violence. And the thing that leads me to ask this question is that I'm, I'm spending a lot of time right now reading um, uh, these really interesting and beautiful and moving texts by Ukrainian poets about Babu Yar and um, many of them trying to um, come to terms with, with something that they hadn't been taught. Um, and I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm curious because it's uh, obviously there's a, an important conversation to be had with, with children, with Jewish children, with friends of Jewish children. Um, but but um, is there a, I don't know, potentially a, a, an, an alliance to be built uh, through this writing as well? Thank you for that question. I'll just jump in real quick because I was just looking at these texts that were recommended. Um, and in teaching, you know, I so I've been teaching this week about Babia to my students and teaching Yiftushenka, who, well, you know, my grandmother, when she, she's so proud, I'm teaching Babia, I'm teaching our history. You're going to teach them Yiftushenka, right? So for her, for her generation, the, you know, yeah, the fact that Yiftushenka was not Jewish doesn't, has no, doesn't matter at all. It's a poet who finally saw Jews and who spoke to them and for them uh, in a time when others weren't. Um, and I personally am writing for an, at once a non-Jewish audience, but I struggle with this notion of persona 
and with who can write about atrocity that they did not experience. Like I, I really struggle with it on an ethical level. So I'm looking forward to engaging in, with these texts, but even reading the Yiftushenka, I am made very uncomfortable in many lines where he says, I am every dead boy. You know, I, it, it makes, it physically makes me uncomfortable. And, 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 and it's supposed to, um, but also I think it makes me more uncomfortable because I know that I'm closer to those dead boys than he is because I would have been one of them and he would not. Um, so yeah, that's my beginning to respond. Did I, did I say something? <clears throat> that's Nina, Nina? Of course, Nina, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I was muted. Um, Sasha had a hand, but read yeah, it. I think, I think I, I just, well, first I'll react to what you said about Yevtoshenko. Yevtoshenko is a very complex figure in Soviet um, uh, literature. Uh, yes, he wrote this poem, which was very important because it was the first time Babi Yar was mentioned, uh, but uh, he was seen as a very official poet who, he played both sides, both the, like dissident, not quite dissident. He was never really dissident, but uh, both unofficial and official, but he was more official. He was very much liked by authorities. He was allowed to go abroad, which other people were not allowed. So in Soviet, from the Soviet point of view, knowing what was going on then in the Soviet Union, he's a very controversial figure, not always I mean, that he wrote about Bobby, uh, the, the Bobby Yar poem is one thing, but many other things he did were very different. Uh, so he's seen in a very strange light, but that's another, I, I wanted to say something else. I wanted to react to some other things people said about, um, about Holocaust not being talked about by those who went through it. I think that's the usual thing, people who went, um, I never heard from my parents about this. I just heard that all my uh, grandparents were killed by fascists. That's what I heard from my childhood. And only later I tried to find out more. And I, I uh, wrote to archives in Latvia and Ukraine, not in Kiev, but in, also when every, every time people say Babi Yar, I, I, I want to say there were tens of thousands of Babi Yars. They were called something else. Uh, yar means a ditch, a ravine. Mm -hmm. And so usually uh, Jews were rounded up. As soon as Nazis conquered, took a village or a town or a city, they rounded up the Jews, put them in a ghetto. And then a few weeks later or a few months later, they would take them to a ditch in a forest. And that's so Yar is a ditch, it's a ravine. Uh, and there were many, many such places. They were not called Babi Yar. They were called like in in uh, Rovno, where my grandmother's family was killed, my maternal grandmother's. Uh, the place is called Sosinki. Sosinki is a forest. Sosinki, it's a kind of tree, Sosna, right? Um, so, and we are my, uh, the place where my paternal grandmother was killed with 25,000 people in two days in Riga, that's called Rumbola, Rumbola Forest. So there were tens of thousands of these Babi Yars, but they were called just like, it was just the name of a place. Like Rumbola is the name of a forest. Babi Yar is the name, of, Sosinki is the name of a forest. And they were in every town, city and village of Ukraine, Moldova, Moldavia. Lithuania, uh, Latvia, Belarus, uh, hundreds of thousands of such Babi Yars. Um, and another thing I wanted to say is um, um, Yera Sugarman, I, I loved your poem, but you said that um, Stalin killed a million? Yeah, it's more. No, it's more like 70 million. I 70 know it's hard million. to imagine, but it's. No, more. no, it's uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I don't want to go on and on. It's a subject I can talk about a lot because I lived with a lot of, it was something that I learned through silence in my family, um, but um, it's just something that has to be 
talked about, especially now, I think in America, I think uh, politically, this is not the time when uh, Jews are encouraged to talk about their sufferings. Um, yeah. I think it's there is a movement towards trying to erase the, what happened to Jews in Europe. Um, so, uh, so I think it's important to talk about. That's a great point. S Sasha, you were gonna say- Yeah, something? just a quick response to Amelia's question, which is such an interesting question about the audience. Uh, and I'm uh, thinking about translation as, you know, since I've come, come in here as a translator, uh, the, the story uh, from which I excerpted a very short bit uh, has that really interesting kind of, it's right after the war, 1945. It has another character who is not Jewish, uh, who is reading over the pages that Dora had transcribed and translated into Russian, right, of this testimony that is given to her in Yiddish. And as he reads it in Russian, he begins to write on the other side of the page, kind of reminiscences about his own family who aren't Jewish, who are also victims of the war, right? So there's this interesting kind of moment uh, that maybe the story excavates, and I wonder whether we also need to kind of excavate it in some ways, when right after the war in the Soviet context, before there is the anti-cosmopolitan campaign, there is some kind of interesting, uh, you know, belief in the in the Soviet brotherhood of people as such, right? That you know by then becomes you know, but later becomes mere propaganda. But there's some moment right at the end of the war when someone like Bergelson maybe begins to imagine how the testimony of a Jewish survivor can become a kind of paratext, right? For other people to engage with and reflect upon in terms of the their own non-Jewish right suffering that has come out of the war that all Soviet people had somehow suffered. So I watch it and, and of course then Bergelson gets executed within six years as a as a cosmopolitan. Right. So uh, but it, there's that brief moment uh where in which I wonder right whether some of the more contemporary work can begin to return to whether in translation, whether in other languages that had themselves been suppressed in the Soviet period. Uh, th that there's some kind of a possibility there to see how that testimony could be addressed to much wider audiences. I, that's just a hunch. It's, it's, I, 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 thank you for this question about audience because I, I was raised to be a model minority Jew. Um, I was always told, you know, whatever you're doing, people are judging Jews by that. And I was supposed to, you know, I, from the time I was a very young kid, I was being trotted out to sing the Manish Tana. It was, I, I was raised during a period of time when a lot of um, Christians and particularly fundamentalist and evangelical Christians were really interested in Judaism. And my parents were faith leaders. So we were often like out there, you know, with these people. Um, and it was never really a question of witness. It was always kind of a question of education. And it was sort of like, um, and I remember in my German class, like I had a German teacher who was German and she would, it was during unification and like, you're not supposed to say reunification because like the parts of Alsace-Lorraine and the parts of Poland, like, the, you know, what what the, the currently united Germany is not the Germany before World War II. Um, and, she, and she would say these things like, you know, that, um, that Germany didn't start World War II because Hitler was an Austrian. And I would say things like, when Napoleon was born in Corsica, it was under Italian control. He's still a Frenchman. You know, like I, I, I would, on September 1st, 1939, you know, I, I, I mean, I knew all of this stuff and I was having these like very sort of public constant um, conversations everywhere. And so I think for me as a poet, my audience has always just been, it's so strange to me now that everyone likes poetry, like sort of the phenomenon by which like poetry is at the inaugural and everyone likes it. Um, and a poet would be, you know, the, uh, the spokesperson for L'Oreal. Um, and so for, for me, the audience was never um, Jews just because I didn't know enough Jews. Like if I was only writing to Jews, I'd be writing to my parents. And um and having found like Jewish spaces like this that that you have built in Rosebud's built and Eric has built and um, has has been really really wonderful and really healing, but in terms of of kind of an audience, um, my my minority is poets. Um, I just figure I'm writing to people who who know poetry. <laughs> Ooh. 
that just takes me right to Lynn's amazing quote about being gathered up as poets, uh, not as Jews. That's just such a stunning quote and a way of reframing uh, the poets as the minority as well. I think, was Sandy raising her hand? I think Sandy Fitterman Lewis wanted to say something. Okay, you can hear me. Uh, this is fascinating to me. I, there's such variety. It's the similarity of topic, and yet everything was, you know, very different. And not being a poet myself, but being here because Yara is my friend, um, this is a, a, a different world. And but the question of audience is very interesting to me, because uh, just in a contemporary sense, you have uh, January sixth with the Camp Auschwitz and the 6MNE. And I have students who don't know what Auschwitz is, Chinese students, you know, I have a variety of students who are wonderful and smart and eager, but I feel like an alien, you know, when I bring up in, uh, anything about uh, post memory that, you know, the, the Holocaust, which I don't like to call that because it already has this kind of ready made meaning. And so I'm curious. Um, if anybody has any thoughts on this kind of resurgence, you know, I, I had never understood what Jews will not replace us until I started hearing about the replacement theory. But this is now, this is what we're facing now. And it's sort of something that we have to figure out what to do to, to, to draw from the past, but also to find some way to address the future. And poetry is part of it, but it's, it's reaching a wider audience is also part of it. And, um, you know, uh, not having the sort of the sort of fixed ideas of what what the Shoah is, and I I focus my work on France because I just want to have you know, a, and you know most of the people don't know that you know seventy six thousand Jews were deported from France and most of them were killed, and it's just I try and you know insinuate it into everything I talk about, and of course then the eyes roll up and there she goes again and we don't want to do this, but it is I think a pressing question how to make the poetry, which is so evocative of the past and of the effects of the past, relevant to our particular situation now. So I, I wondered if anybody had any ideas. <laughs> Open. And I think we'll make this the last um, question since it's getting late and you've all been so generous with your time. So if anyone has any thoughts on making <laughs> The past urgently relevant as I think we all I, think. I think that, I mean, just for me with, with students, um, a really key piece of getting students, particularly students who don't have heritages that go back multiple generations to the United States is making clear that Nazi ideology um, started in the US, that the eugenics movement and Jim Crow is what the Nazi movement was modeling their um, ideology and activities on and that you can't understand these, um, you can't understand what happened in Europe without understanding what was happening in the US and how that kind of, um, what, what starts at home boomerangs back, boomerangs back. And, that, that the, and that particularly with like um, the, um, if, if, they're, if they're Asian students in particular, then the, the various kinds of immigration limitations that are being placed, um, in the United States um, have very, very powerful implications both for, for Jews and for um, Asians. Um, I want to try to really wrap things up because it's uh, getting late and you've all again been so generous and uh, many people have left. I'm so grateful to all of you. Thank you so much to the readers. Um, I. I'm just grateful to have shared in this space. So um, hope to see you at the next event, which I didn't even announce, but it's October 20th um, on Poetics of the Animal. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you. It's wonderful to, to meet you. others. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great to meet everyone. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Oh.